1 Corinthians 15 and we're going to read the section which is <clears throat> the focus of this morning's study which begins at the 12th verse and runs through to the 19th. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Amen. Now, before we turn and look at this together, let's ask God's help, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, help us as we study this to be able to concentrate, to think clearly, to understand Use our study this morning to change our lives, we pray. To bring us from confusion to faith, from doubt to certainty, from rebellion to obedience. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians is devoted to teaching on one specific subject. And that, of course, is this whole matter of the resurrection. Leading up to Christmas, we find ourselves dealing with the issue of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Who is he and why did he come? And we discovered in the weeks preceding Christmas just how foundational is that doctrine to a grasp of Christianity and to being able to declare it effectively uh, amongst our colleagues and our friends. Now we find ourselves uh, studying, if you like, the bedfellow of the doctrine of the Incarnation, namely the doctrine of the Resurrection, and finding, along with the truth of the Incarnation, the fact that the Resurrection is a vital area of Christian doctrine. Some of us, I think, have begun to understand, after some time, just exactly what is going on here as we study the Bible. It suddenly dawned on us that the way we think is related to the way we live. And we've begun, for the first time, to put the pieces together and begun to realize that it is in coming to an understanding of biblical truth that we will then be enabled to live biblical lives. Others are living still with the perspective, which goes something like this, I wish we could get past this Christian doctrine and instruction and get on to some of the practicalities of Christian living. And such individuals, I hope, will be brought to see that learning how to think correctly is the key to learning how to live properly. It's because of this and a few other reasons that as a group of elders we have begun in this last while to study Christian doctrine together. Uh, specifically the basics of the faith so that we might understand exactly where we are in relationship to the Bible and one another and in the leadership of this church. And we hope in time that what we establish as a model amongst ourselves will be something that is enjoyed and benefited by uh, in terms of everyone in our congregation. One of the books that we've been using contains this quote, Theology, which is simply the science of the knowledge of God and awareness of who God is and what he's done and what that means in this uh, day in which we're living, theology is not for a few religious eggheads with a flair for abstract debate. It is everybody's business. Everybody's business. And getting doctrine right 
is the key to getting everything else right in our lives. Many who are unhappy, who are uncomfortable, who are unsettled, who are looking for various solutions to problems that they have, live with the idea that if they could get some kind of superficial blanket to cover over all of this, they would be fine. But they have worn through many a blanket and still they face the predicament. And the answer, my dear friends, is not so much that you need these superficial cures, but it is that together we need a good dose of biblical doctrine. We need to understand who God is and what he's done and what that means for us in our daily lives. And so it is that in that framework, we study here in 1 Corinthians 15 this issue of the resurrection. Now, the matter of the resurrection is a matter of some debate in the minds of different people. There are those who like to say, as uh, I've heard them, that they are very good Christians, but they do not believe in the resurrection. Now, what they mean by that is that they have some kind of interest in Christian living, and they may even be trying to live out the Sermon on the Mount, but that they simply have decided that the resurrection is an addendum with which they can do perfectly well without. Now, what is our answer to that? The answer to that is that the only Jesus in whom we can come to faith is the Jesus of the Scriptures. And the Jesus of the Scriptures is our resurrected Jesus. And therefore, to believe in any other Jesus than the Jesus to whom we're introduced in the Bible means that whatever we want to call ourselves, in terms of the New Testament's definition of the word, such individuals cannot be Christian. They may like Christian things, they may even do Christian things. But to be a Christian means believing in the Jesus of the New Testament, the historical Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. Therefore, the man or the woman who says, well, I uh, like just to set that aside, I'm sorry, but by biblical definition, you have put yourself out with the pale of genuine Christian faith. Michael Green, writing on the issue, says, Christianity does not hold the resurrection to be one among many tenets of belief. Without faith in the resurrection, there would be no Christianity at all. The Christian church would never have begun. The Jesus movement would have fizzled out like a wet firework at his execution. Christianity stands or falls with the truth of the resurrection. Once disprove it, and you have disposed of Christianity. Historians tell us that there was one particular site in the Battle of Waterloo, which was regarded by both Wellington and Napoleon as crucial. In the course of the battle, it was taken and given up three times. And eventually the British victory, historians say, was largely hinged to the fact that Wellington understood how vital it was to take that piece of territory. With it, there was victory. Without it, there was only defeat. And in the same way, when you come to the Bible, you discover that the truth of the resurrection is like that piece on the battleground. With it, we may go forward with confidence. Without it... We have no basis whatsoever for gathering this morning, listening to somebody teach from this book, and paying one whit of attention to what it has to say to us. It is the very heart of our message. As a schoolboy in Scotland, on a number of occasions, I have a distinct recollection of boys showing up at school after 10 or 11 days' absence, carrying a jar of kind of murky-looking water with something floating in it. I don't know whether this is a barbaric custom from your cousins across the Atlantic, but what these boys were bringing to school with them was their appendix. And they had been absented from school to have their appendix removed, and the surgeon gave it to them in a jar. And they would come, and uh, some days there would be an appendix on the desk, and another day there would be a couple of tonsils and various bits and pieces, and they would bring them and put them on the desk. And of course, being a boy and uh, not really knowing very much, I'd say, well, where did he take it from? You know, and then, of course, we went behind the blackboard so he could show us the scar. And, uh, and then I said, well, how, how can you live without it? 
And they said, oh, it's okay, you can live without it. It's just an appendix. I have it in the jar, but I'm fine. Now, there are people whose perspective on the resurrection is exactly the same. You can live your Christian life without it. It's an appendix. You simply put it in a jar and carry it around with you. You can show it to folks if you want. It's really an irrelevancy. It doesn't really matter. My loved ones, listen, it matters. The whole New Testament pulsates with this truth. The resurrection is absolutely, fundamentally, crucially vital. Remove it, and there are disastrous consequences. Now, it is to this that Paul gives himself, beginning in verse 12. If it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, as it is preached, he's just said that for 11 verses, how then can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Let me show you, he says, the logical consequences of such a perspective. Let me, he says, for the sake of argument, allow for a moment that your position is factual. That what you're actually claiming, some of you, is correct, and that there is no resurrection. Then let me show you what the implications are. There are seven of them. We'll go through them. First implication is that without a resurrection, Jesus Christ himself was never raised. If there's no resurrection, then Jesus is not alive. That's what he says in verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. No one ever has. No one ever will rise from the dead. If that's the case, then Jesus fits that framework and he is not risen from the dead. To deny the resurrection of the dead is to deny the resurrection of the one, namely Jesus, who makes any and all resurrections possible. There's no way out of it, and it's the way of modern man, the way of modern thinking. It seems ever so intelligent. It begins like this. People do not rise from the dead. Assertion. Deduction. Therefore, Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead. Conclusion. Forget the whole affair. That's how it goes. Paul says, you know what? If the assertion is correct, the deduction is okay, and the conclusion is absolutely dead on. That's the implication. No resurrection. If there is no resurrection, if nobody any time ever gets resurrected, then Jesus himself was never raised. Now, he's not refuting this. He's just taking them down a logical progression. And let me try and be as true to it as is the apostle. First implication then... Christ was never raised. Secondly, our preaching is useless. This is verse 14. He says, now listen, if there's no resurrection, then Jesus has not been raised. And if Jesus has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. I don't think he's referring here to the act of preaching, which of course, (laughs) this is a very apt uh, recognition on the part of some of us. Our preaching is many times useless, and uh, we bemoan that. But I don't think he's talking about whether it was a good sermon or a bad sermon. I think what he's saying is that the content of what we preach is absolutely useless. If you remove the resurrection, then we have nothing to say. It is absolutely empty. If you turn back to the opening chapter of 1 Corinthians and in verse 21, you'll see there that what he's talking about is the content of their preaching. He says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. Don't let me stop here and preach, except just for a moment. For those who say, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be very wise and I'm going to put it all together and I will eventually intellectually discover God, let me tell you, that root has a big cul-de-sac at the end of it. In the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God instead was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached through the foolishness of the content of the proclamation. And the content of the proclamation was very simple. Jesus of Nazareth was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a death for sinners, was resurrected from the dead, was raised to the right hand of the Father on high. He will return from there to bring those who are ready to meet him. All says modern man, total foolishness. Stupidity. You're telling me that one man from a tiny, unknown province in the whole of this world, in this one moment in history, 
is the key to the whole universe, is the key to life and death and time and eternity. Yes. Through the foolishness of the content of the proclamation, God has chosen to save people. But, says Paul, if there is no resurrection back now in 15, our preaching is totally devoid of any substance at all. Take the resurrection out and there's nothing left. Now, despite the fact that there is compelling logic here, churches throughout this nation continue to try and lead their people forward by, as it were, removing all the, all the difficult bits. So the minister comes in and he tells the congregation, now listen, you're a very intelligent group of people. And of course they sit up. They say, ha, he's been paying attention to us. He knows, he knows us. I'm glad. Yeah, I didn't think he knew us, but I, th- I think he knows us now. Yes. Now you're a very intelligent group of people and I don't want to stumble you in any way with any silly stuff. Hmm. Little nudge to the wife. This is going to be a good one. And so I want you to know this morning that uh, you don't really have to believe in the resurrection. Or for that matter in any of the miracles. And now that I've removed these difficulties for you, let's go on about the business of Christianity. Be a bit like a fellow calling 22 boys together in the park for a game of soccer. They're all standing around. One boy says, where's the ball? The guy who has convened the time says, forget the ball. Let's just start the game. There are ministers presiding over congregations in the exact same way. You doubt me? Let me quote to you from one. This is in my file since 92. It's the importance of keeping files. The minister says to his congregation, this is a transcript of the Sunday morning service preached by the Reverend Ha Ha at such and such a church. You think I'm telling you? You're wrong. This is what he says. I suggest that we confess openly that the resurrection is a myth. This is not to say that it is not true. Okay, I'm tracking with you, Pastor. Yes, okay. On the contrary, to say that the resurrection is a myth is to say that it represents the deepest kind of truth. To say that the resurrection is myth is to acknowledge that it is not clear what happened historically when the Bible describes Jesus as being raised from the dead. It means we do not have to believe in the literal truth in any one of the biblical accounts of the resurrection. To say that the resurrection is myth is to recognize it as a symbol of transcendent truth more than a historic fact. And as a symbol of the resurrection that means that God's truth is open-ended. God's word is not something all spelled out and nailed down in the literature. Okay? Now, this gentleman is not paying attention to his Bible because he is, he is living with the silly idea that you can take away the truth of the resurrection and still have something left worth talking about. Now, any sensible person in the congregation should at that point immediately stand up and go out for a, for a, for a pancake or two. And frankly, bring a couple back and throw them at the, at the character. Or suggest that he goes out for a pancake or two. Because why would sensible men and women come in and sit and listen to this? Because Paul makes it perfectly clear. If you remove the resurrection, your preaching is useless. Yes, it is. Useless. There's no condemnation on this gentleman per se. Well, a little. Thirdly, without a resurrection, your faith is useless. Your faith is useless. Isn't that what he says at the end of verse 14? If Christ has not been raised, the preaching is useless and so is your faith. Now, do it follows. Their faith depended on the gospel. If the gospel was a sham, then so was the faith upon which 
the gospel was based. What is the gospel? It's there in verse 3. I received what I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared. That's the gospel. Now, says Paul, without a resurrection, there's no basis to the gospel. If there is no basis to the gospel that we preached, and your faith is based on that gospel, then your faith isn't worth a scrap. That's what he says. Logical. Now, you see how this instructs us about the nature of biblical faith. Biblical faith is exactly that biblical faith. It's not some vague hopefulness. If people say to one another, say, you know, I suppose the only thing that matters in these days is that we have faith. And it's a kind of pleasantry. And it sounds sort of right until you think about it for more than 30 seconds and you say, well, what does it mean just as long as we have faith? Faith in what? Or faith in whom? We've got to have faith in something. It's not faith in air. Faith in possibilities. And the Bible is very, very clear when it speaks in terms of faith. It's not just talking about faith in anything. It's talking about faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That biblical faith is trust in truth. That it rests on an objective reality. As Luther said, there is no Christianity where there are no assertions. That it is based on propositional truth. That there are propositions which the Bible lays down. Proposition A leads to B. And A plus B equals C. And so on. If you remove those propositions, you have no basis for discussion, dialogue or faith. Christian faith is trust in truth. It is trust in the truth of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. And faith in Christ means commitment to Him as the one who died and rose. And anything less than this is less than what the New Testament defines as Christian faith. People say, well, I'm a Christian, but I do not believe that Jesus died and rose. Well, by what definition do you declare yourself a Christian? If to become a Christian is to believe in Jesus who declares that he died and that he rose. No resurrection, then Jesus isn't alive. No resurrection, preaching is futile. No resurrection, faith is irrelevant. Fourthly, without the resurrection, the apostles are all false witnesses. And indeed, all who proceeded and followed them. Verse 15 More than that, he says, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. And of course we know that. Acts chapter 2, verse 24. Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, and he explains to his listeners, God raised him, Jesus, from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The people in Jerusalem understood that perfectly well. Here is this chap, Peter, and he's out in the street and he's declaring that this uh, sepulcher just down the road is empty and the reason it is empty is not because he and his buddies have dragged the body away and hid it and then come out on the basis of a mythology to get their heads chopped off. It's not empty because Jesus was only half dead and crawled off and went somewhere and he'll be coming back some time later. It is empty, says Peter, because God raised him from the dead. He was clear about his proclamation. The people were clear about what they heard. Paul says, if there is no resurrection, then Jesus is not resurrected. And if Jesus is not erected, Peter was on the streets of Jerusalem lying through his teeth. And so was I in Athens when I came to this great pluralistic culture and I saw all these idols to the unknown God, etc. And I said to them, listen folks, God has given proof of what I'm telling you. By raising Jesus from the dead. So says Paul, in those kind of statements, without a resurrection, we declare ourselves to be liars. You see, the apostles were not advice givers. They were gospel proclaimers. They had testified that God had raised Jesus from the dead. And if there was no resurrection then they were detected as individuals lacking in integrity. Just in passing, this is interesting to me at least. This is quite a staggering thought, is it not? When you think that the apostles died for the proclamation of Jesus and the resurrection. 
That people tell me, say, well, it was, a, it was a mythology, you see, and the disciples made this up because the thing had got going well and it had gone into a kind of reverse in this experience at Golgotha and they got together in a room and said, hey, we were having a, a great time doing all that stuff. Why don't we just crank it up again? And somebody said, yeah, but Jesus is dead. And someone else said, yeah, but it doesn't matter. We can get it going. We can say the same kind of thing or whatever it is. It doesn't pass. It doesn't pass the, the scan of a blind guide, you know. It doesn't. It's the suggestion that the disciples went out and on the basis of pure fabrication about which they knew, they got themselves killed. Why? They weren't making money. They weren't becoming popular. They were getting chased, beaten, hounded, trashed, talked. John Blanchard's lovely, succinct statement, let it ring in your mind. Men may die for a conviction. But man will not die for a concoction. And their conviction post-Calvary was that Jesus was dead. That was their conviction. When the ladies came from the tomb and said, He is no longer there, He has risen, just as He said, the response of these men on the basis of conviction was, You are out of your tiny mind. They did not start from the conviction that he was alive. They started from the conviction that he was dead. So how in the world did they hit the streets saying the absolute reverse of that? And I am asked to believe with modern man one of these paltry little explanations. While man in his arrogance will not bow down before the truth of Scripture and realize that the great balance of evidence leads a man or a woman to the very conviction of this truth. It's pride that keeps you from believing, sir. It's pride that keeps you from believing, madam. If there is no resurrection, fifthly, you are still in your sins. In other words, all the hell that we know in this earth, all of our sinful thoughts, all of our rebellions, all of our cursings, all of our cheating, all of our dreadful arrogance, still is attached to us. And there is no way to get clean. We're in the dreadful predicament of Lady Macbeth. Our hands are stained with the blood of our sinfulness and we want these damned spots to be out, but all the perfumes of Arabia cannot deal with them. And on our hands is the very damnation which awaits us in our future if there is no resurrection. Now, what is Paul doing here? What he's doing is perfectly clear. He is helping these individuals to see the illogicality of this assertion. Because these folks knew that they were no longer in their sins. You only need to go back to chapter 6 and realize what they were. They were idolaters and homosexuals and perverts and cheats and liars and disobedient and a bunch of riffraff. Unbelievable, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And says, Paul, that's what some of you were. That's what you used to be. And they knew they used to be. They knew they were different. They knew they were changed. And so now he says to them in chapter 15, think it out. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then you're still in your sins. And they must have said to one another, but we know we're not in our sins. That's the point he was getting at. So that they would then say, you know what? There is a resurrection. There has to be. Otherwise we would still be 
trapped and chained by all these things. You see, it points up as well, dear ones, this morning, that the issue of a man and a woman outside of Christ is not that they are simply misdirected and in need of direction. It's not simply that they're unhappy and in need of happiness. It's, it's, it's a much deeper predicament. It is this, that we are in our sins and we can't get out. We're burying ourselves deeper every day. Indeed, Paul says to the Ephesians, describing their pre-converted condition, he said, you were dead in your transgressions and in your sins. You were absolutely stuck and you couldn't liberate yourself. He says to the Colossians, you were dead in your sins. And Jesus looks the Pharisees in the face and he says to them, listen guys, you will die in your sins. Without a resurrection, their past is useless. Without a resurrection, their future is nowhere. Second last, without a resurrection, those who have died are lost. That's verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Every funeral that I have conducted over the last 20 years of pastoral ministry, I've stood and, and stood on the basis of lies, spoken the words, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. Every time I've said that over the last 20 years, I have simply stood up and spoken out a lie if there is no resurrection. That's why for the life of me, I can't understand how a man can be in pastoral ministry and not believe the fundamentals of the faith. I don't, I don't know what in the world you have to talk about or what you're supposed to do or how you can lead and guide a congregation. Without a resurrection, death is not falling asleep in Jesus and waking up to see the smile of his face. Without the resurrection, death is a hard confirmation of our lostness. Without a resurrection, death means that we're all doomed to perish, that we all live without hope and without God. And one of the characteristics of paganism in every generation is that it is just that, it's without hope and without God. Paul says, if you take away the resurrection, then the Christians are in the same predicament as the pagans. Our whole existence, our past and our present and our future, has come to absolutely nothing. Now, like me, you're saying, could we please get to verse 20? Because I noticed there's a but at verse 20, and uh, I think it gets a little more encouraging from there, Al. And uh, this is sort of weighing me down a little. Well, it's supposed to. Supposed to. And if it doesn't weigh us down to the point that we realize what a wonderful, amazing change has been unleashed in our lives as the Spirit of God has opened our eyes and unstopped our ears, then it ought to weigh us down when we think about our non-saved friends and loved ones and colleagues to whom we return tomorrow because they are dead in their sins. They're without hope and without God in the world, without any resurrection from the dead. Preaching is useless. Faith is futile. Nothing has any hope. There is no future. No wonder punks write on their jackets, no future. No wonder the songs of the present generation just cry out the angst of the 60s. It hasn't just come around as a fashion. It's come around in the awareness of the fact that everybody said in the 60s it was getting better, a little better all the time, and it got a little worse all the time. And here we are facing the end of the 90s and we're in deep trouble. And the, and, and the young people are saying, this stinks. This absolutely is horrible. And they're right without a resurrection. Without a resurrection, go out and become a hedonist. Without a resurrection, go out and find a cause. But don't, for goodness sake, let us live the way we're living now. With a mortgage and a garage door opener and scrambling through our days and saying, Woo, this is fun, isn't it? The answer is you take away the resurrection and it gets less fun. All the time. That's why Hemingsway took a shotgun, blew the top off of his head in his mansion. Because he understood life is a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness. Can't have it both ways. 
Last of all, without the resurrection, we are of all men most to be pitied. Most to be pitied. That's verse 19. If for this life only we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Now, some people think that what Paul is implying here is that the Christian life is a kind of mean existence at best, and so hopefully there's a prize at the end, otherwise it's a raw deal. You know, like, uh, I know this is tough, but you're getting an ice cream after the dentist, that sort of thing. Now, only another minute to go, and then we go out for a milkshake. And so as long as there's a milkshake, but I go through all this and then I find out no milkshake, I am ticked. And what he's saying here is you take away the resurrection, it's just this, 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 and nothing. Now, the point that he makes, he makes from verse 17 on. Just follow his logic. He says, listen, by believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus to forgive our sins. That's what these folks have done. But he says, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then that means that not only do we not have present forgiveness, but we've also lost all hope for the future as well. So you can't say, well, at least I've forgiven my sins just now, and uh, there'll be a, something later. He says, no. If there's no future, the present's shut down. And if we have believed in the future, when there's no future, then of all beings, we are the most to be pitied. Not because Christian existence is interested only in the future, but because, of, because the loss of the future means the loss of the present and the loss of the past. If there's no future, the present is irrelevant. Yesterday's dead and gone, and tomorrow's out of sight. So let's party. Allah, Janis Joplin, Chris Christopherson, anybody you like. That's the modern existential view. Yesterday's dead and gone. Tomorrow's not coming. Now is the time. Existentialism. Let's have it. There's no resurrection. There's no judgment. There's no place to go. It's oblivion. It's annihilation. When you're dead, you're gone. Wait a minute. Did you ever consider the possibility of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Forget that. Dead men don't rise. Therefore, Jesus didn't rise. Oh, that's real scientific. I must... Yeah, we must come back to that sometime. Atoms don't split, therefore you can't split the atom, therefore put that aside. Large objects cannot rise off the ground and fly through the air. It doesn't happen, therefore it won't happen, therefore there's no law of aerodynamics, therefore there's no flight. No vessel could be made large enough to carry enough coal to cross the Atlantic Ocean. It is impossible, therefore it will never happen. And so on and so on. Science doesn't go at things that way. Science starts with possibilities, lays out the opportunities, examines it on the basis of that. But when people come to faith, they don't want to believe. Therefore, we start and marshal our arguments to that end. Now, let me just finish with this thought. This whole paragraph ought to be deeply disturbing to those who try and make the Christian faith more acceptable to modern man by getting rid of the hard stuff. Last year in Britain, a bishop removed one of the clergymen in the Anglican Church. Some of you may have followed this. This is from the Times, uh, the the London Times, the Times, uh, Friday, August the 5th, 1994. He removes this chap from office service, and the chap goes on a program on the BBC on the Wednesday night following the event. And the the journalist says that... uh, the, the pastor declared, when asked, no, he did not believe in God. This is the pastor. God, he said, was a concept humanity itself had created and represented no more than the potential for good within the human spirit. Looking serene, indeed almost angelic, and still wearing his clerical collar, the vicar said he had no idea what happened after death. The Lord's Prayer, though he kept repeating it, was no more than glorious doggerel. There had been no virgin birth, and Christ, by definition, was not the Son of God. Now, the mystery is not that the bishop removed him. The mystery is that his congregation wanted to keep him. Now, what was he doing? 
He was saying, listen, let's get rid of all the hard stuff, the difficult stuff, the miraculous stuff. Let's reduce Christianity to the things we really know, which is nothing. And then let's give nothing to everybody. If he'd only read 12 through 19 of 1 Corinthians 15, he would have realized that as soon as you remove that, nothing is exactly what you're left with. Now, here's the thing, loved ones. We're going to go on in verse 20 next week to pick up the affirmation by Paul in relationship to the resurrection. Reinsert the resurrection and all of these things are immediately reversed. But listen, the nations of the earth are in need of this news. The people in our offices and in our streets and neighborhoods are in need of this news. The reason for this great emptiness that pervades so much of our culture is because of the work of the philosophers of the late 19th and early 20th century, fellows like Bertrand Russell and uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. I came across this week in my study a quote from Sartre's journal in 1980. And I'll finish up with this. In 1980, he writes in his journal, The idea that there is no purpose, only personal petty ends for which we fight, The idea that we make little revolutions, but there is no goal for mankind. One cannot think such things. They tempt you incessantly, especially if you are old and think, oh well, I'll be dead in five years at the most. In fact, says Sartre, I think ten, but it might well be in five. In any case, the world seems ugly, bad, and without hope. There, that's the cry of despair of an old man who will die in despair. But that's exactly what I resist. I know I shall die in hope. But that hope needs a foundation. Four weeks later, they laid Sartre's body in the dust of French soil. See, he lived all of his life logically, resolutely, concluding the lack of factuality of these things. He was so bright that he understood it. This leads me to total hopelessness. Then he says to himself, but I resist that. I shall die in hope. Then he says, but hope Needs a foundation. Full stop. Presumably he closed his journal and he said, I'm going to have to go get that foundation. Did he find it? Have you found it? If there is no resurrection, Jesus is not alive, preaching is futile, faith is empty, the apostles are liars, Dead people are gone for good. There is no future. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ is risen from the dead. Great story out of Czechoslovakia this week. Came out of the revolution. The communists had charge of this vast crowd in a square in Czechoslovakia. And they're all gathered there. And uh, one of the uh, bishops from the Orthodox Church came up and said that he would like just uh, a moment to speak to the crowd concerning uh, Christianity. The the communist official said, well, five minutes is all you're getting and, uh, and, and that's your lot. Oh, said the bishop, I only need 20 seconds. And he stood up and he said, Jesus Christ is alive. And the whole square responded, Jesus Christ is alive. Let us bow together in a moment of prayer. Father, there is only one response to this. That is to acknowledge the logicality of this reasoning and to cry out to you for mercy and for grace. If Jesus is not alive, if resurrection is not true, then the whole thing is over. Past, present, and future. If he is, then his love 
so amazing and so divine demands our souls, our lives, our all. Help us to think clearly that we might respond properly and live rightly for Jesus' sake. Amen.